Acts 2.42. In the church as a family, I'll uh, take some uh, eight points, I guess. So the first one is devoted to apostles' teachings. So when we gather together as church, it is not unidirectional, as I just said, that hearing and leaving, but you are supposed to devote. The meaning of devote is loyalty to learn. Study being committed to learn. The objective of your devotion is to learn and grow in faith. Now, I want to put a question to all of you out here is, besides coming to Sunday, how many of you spend your time in reading your word of God, calling it as a devotion? Devotion is nothing but not reading. It is not just casual reading. Devotion means a sincere effort to learn and grow. How will you prepare for your MSET exam? How will you prepare your exam for IIT or any group one or group two? Do you make your sincere effort to learn and grow? What sincere effort are you making to learn and grow in your faith? I'm challenging you right now while I'm encouraging your hearts through the word of God. Let us see Ephesians 4.14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and the craftiness of the people in their deceitful schemes. If you do devotion to the word of God and if you have the apostolic teachings to grow in faith, then you will not be like children. It is not me who is telling, it is Paul is telling. If you're not devoting to the word of God in your day-to-day -day life, not just Sunday coming and listening, but you're called infants, small people, you don't know the word of God, because of which you're tossed back and forth hmm? through the false preachings when they come, you're tossed back and forth, you're confused, you don't know what is the truth because you don't read because you don't read the word of God, because you don't meditate, because you don't devote, you don't know what is the truth. Whatever pastor is telling is right. Today, what I say, you listen. Tomorrow, you will listen something in the YouTube. Whatever he says, you don't know whether he is right preaching or wrong preaching. You follow it if you don't know the word of God. If you don't meditate yourself, that is what Paul is telling. You will be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind. Is it not the state of the universal church today? Theologians say in the global arena, there is only 2.7% of so-called 100% Christians who, know, who knows the correct gospel. 97.3% of the people are getting tossed away like this by the every wind of the doctrine which is coming. And Telangana, our two Telugu states are no different for the false preachings. How are you placed today? These people, when they preach, they preach with cunning and craftiness to, with deceitful schemes. Paul is writing in context to the preachers. Okay? Second, second scripture, 2 second Timothy 2.15. Do your best, present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. If you think you have the gift of preaching, then you need to be not ashamed to correctly handle the word of truth. You need to be an approved worker of God when you're standing in God's presence to speak about the word of God. It is Timothy who is telling, read carefully. Present yourself to God as one approved. If I'm standing here, I need to be 100% sure that I'm not preaching false preaching. Only then, if I consider that I'm approved by God and I'm sure that doctrinally I'm not doing a false preaching, I should not be ashamed to stand here before God's presence when I preach the word of God to you guys. But the current so-called pastors, when they are standing, are they introspecting this scripture in their life? First Timothy 4, 15, 16. 
be diligent what is the meaning of diligent diligent means be 100% sure when you ask some people they say i guess so means they are not confident of what they are speaking but it is not when you when it says it is diligent you need to be 100% sure on what you are preaching be diligent in these matters in these matters means in the matters of the doctrines you will see the subsequent uh, thing so be diligent be diligent in these matters give yourself wholly to them only little or wholly when pastor is preaching for 40 minutes or 50 minutes 50 minutes do i need to listen diligently only 5 minutes or the entire sermon wholly to them grammar is very very essential when you are reading the bible don't be a casual reader you need to be an explorer to find the meat of the word of god when you read the word of god it gives you the meat you need to find the meat of the word of god when you are reading it okay holy to them so that everyone may see your progress watch your life and doctrine closely so when you are living a life when you are doing a diligent study you are supposed to in introspect your life with the scriptures that is what timothy is telling it is not brother jones who is telling it so watch your life and doctrine closely preserve in them what is the meaning of preserving when you go for writing an mset or iit or anything you preserve all the important formulas important question and answers which you think they may be coming those are only the materialistic things of this world but these are the word of god which will give you life which is abundant life everlasting life which is in christ jesus are you preserving the word of god are you introspecting your life in respect to the doctrines in respect to the word of god if not please ask yourself okay first timothy 41 the spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow the deceiving spirits and the things taught by demons you may be thinking pastor is preaching huh you see it is not me who is telling first timothy 41 the spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow the, the deceiving spirits and things taught by demons so many people who whoever are going to the false preachings false churches they may be thinking i am going to a wonderful church but timothy is telling if he is a false preacher then it is not he is preaching but it is the demon from him is speaking okay second timothy 3:16 all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness when you go to 31st of december pastors will give you promise for the year absolutely unbiblical all scripture is god breathed not one scripture for that particular year those are all the traditions which people brought out of their human mind is their mind beyond the bible when the bible is very clearly telling all scriptures is god breathed and useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness at the end of the day when you read the word of god you are supposed to grow in righteousness this is the promise on december 31st for your next year that means when you read the other word of god in the next of the year is it not growing in the righteousness for you nonsensical teaching okay so the first point what i'm trying to tell is when you gather together as church it is not just coming on sunday and again coming on sunday but it is making a conscious effort to learn and grow in the word of god we want to live according to the apostles we do not want to be living like the casual believers christianity and the born again believers are not casual christians guys there is no concept of ca casualness 
in Christianity. When you're called as born again believers, your heart should be craving to serve people. Your heart should be craving to serve Christ. The second point, fellowship. We saw, right? First one was devote yourself to apostles' teachings. Second was fellowship. What is the meaning of fellowship? One aspect of fellowship is love one another. So all these are in the context of the church. Okay? So 1 John 4.20 Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sisters, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have not seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. So all these scriptures are in the context of the church. So if you say that you love your brother and sister here, then you are supposed to have love for one another. And if you hate, and if you don't love your brother, then it is a serious issue that, that the scripture is telling, if you, if you do not love your brother, then whom they have not seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. That means it's a salvation issue. Maybe you may be talking nicely when you see a brother over the face, but internally within your heart, you may be having bitterness. So that's a serious issue. If you claim to say that you love God, you're supposed to love one another within the body of Christ, within the local church. Now I want you to ask, do we all know the names of one another? That's one of the uh, questions which we can pose that how much we love one another. Do we know that some brother as part of this local church is going through some trials? He needs some love, not your money, your time. Some counseling, some guidance, some depression he is going on. If you claim to say you love God, you are supposed to love one another, which means you are supposed to involve in that brother's life and make an impact to his life when you say you love one another and when you say you love God. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Absolutely salvation issue. The second part of the scripture. See, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If you don't love your brother, or sister as part of the local church, then I'm sorry to say you, if you're only coming on Sundays, not involving in the lives and families of the other people within the church, then it is not a agape love, the biblical love which God expects out of your life. Okay? There are 59 scriptures only in the New Testament which speaks about love one another. Only New Testament, 59 times is there prominence that you are supposed to love one another or it is very casually that, okay, yeah, I learned a new thing today. Good, I need to love. Okay, fine. From tomorrow and next minute, I am living the same life. No change in me. Okay, so next, encourage one another. Second point, Hebrew 3.13, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the sin's deceitfulness. We need to understand very important guys, though you have accepted Lord Jesus Christ, you have been positionally sanctified person, but you need to earn out your salvation till you meet Lord Jesus Christ face to face. You still battle with sin. You still have Adam's nature in you. If you say, the moment I accept Jesus Christ, I'm a perfect person, I don't have any sin. There are people who are very famous people, even in this world, in India as well, who says, once you accept Jesus Christ, there is no sin in you. You don't commit sin at all. You are a 100% perfect being. There are people who preach this. Okay? But... Paul himself says in Romans 7 
i do the things which which i do not want to do it is not i who is doing it it is the adam's nature which is there within me is doing it when paul himself is telling that he is struggling with the adam's nature within him who are you and me to say that i am a perfect being and there is no manifestation of adam's nature in me so as part of the local church hebrew author is writing that you are supposed to encourage one another daily not once in a month not once in a year when was the last time that you called one another in the local church scripture is telling encourage one another daily as you call it today maybe we don't even call once in a month first thessalonica 5:11 therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing what you are supposed to do you are supposed to build one another up our battle is against the evil forces of this world ephesians 6:12 we need one another's support we need one another's love especially after this covid there is a great need in the context of the local church where people are dying so you see that in hebrew there is hardness of adam's nature is there in us we battle with the sin that is the that is the reason we need one another support when you go to fight with someone do you need many people or you go alone to fight with someone does a king go to a battle alone or does he go with an army he goes with an army church local local church is the army for one another a church is called a spiritual community which you need to understand which is missed okay so you see that there are 29 scriptures only in the new testament which speaks about encourage one another in the body 59 love one another 29 encourage one another fourth point when we gather together as church we worship together as corporately one person worshiping jesus other person worshiping his own understanding of jesus who is not the biblical jesus if you do not have a correct understanding of the attributes of god you may have an understanding of jesus something totally different if you go to islam they say we know jesus but the jesus of quran and the jesus of the bible is different if you if people worship the jesus of the quran the jesus name is not glorified so you are supposed to know the jesus of bible so let us see psalms 34:3 glorify the lord with me let us all let let us exalt his name together means when you come together as church it is not lone worship but it is the worship of the church as one body corporately okay one more scripture romans 12 1 to 3 therefore i urge you brothers and sisters in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god this is your true and proper worship do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what is god's will his good pleasing and perfect will lot of us may be having an understanding singing songs clapping they may thinking oh psychosomatic feeling oh i worship god perfectly today but what is true worship you need to understand true worship is a living sacrifice every part of your body the things what you tend to see the talk what you tend to make the acts what you tend to do the what what you are going to do every member of your body should be holy because your god is holy that is the true worship which god is expecting not the worship that you come here and then like you know clap and sing songs and think that okay i worship that is 
this type of worship god is looking from you your mind should be transformed you cannot live like a casual believer like even gentiles live like that you may be doing good deeds even gentile good deeds but how it is different your life the life of a believer is a sacrificial life brothers we need to understand you you see here offer your bodies as a living sacrifice you have only 100 rupees and a brother within the church is in need you may say i have only 100 rupees i cannot give what sacrifice are you making but paul is telling you that 100 bucks to the guy who is in need and trust in god's faithfulness god will provide you such sacrifices god is looking at you okay lord supper okay this is fourth point i'll just give some background to this in the first century when apostles were there there was a concept of fellowship meal as well the church is all about fellowship so in the first century we have a concept called potluck right now right similarly it was there in the first century people used to bring food from their homes and after taking part in the bread and 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 the wine they were supposed to have fellowship meal the objective of fellowship meal is not that you fill your stomach but as part of that fellowship meal it is an opportunity that you talk to one another encourage one another there may be some person in depression there may be some person in the financial need or there may be some person who is in genuine need need your prayer support because when these people in the first corinthians were not doing with the institution which god ordained and brought people were going with their own plates and having separately rich people going separately and poor were left out with no food then paul is condemning here the corinthians church when you are gathering together you are not honoring the god but you are defaming god's glory because you are going with your own supper and you are insulting the people who do not have the food now whatever i explained you will see in the scripture so then when you come together it is not the lord supper you eat for when you are eating some of you go ahead with your own private suppers as a result one person remains hungry and other gets drunk don't you have homes to eat and drink or do you despise the church of god by humiliating those who have nothing what shall i say to you shall i praise you certainly not in this matter i want you to digest now so the purpose of lord supper when you meet together if you also have fellowship meal is to encourage one another now that if we don't have the fellowship meal in our celebration church you can spend 5 to 10 minutes talking to one another is there any prayer need to you brother are you challenging with any sin do you need any support that is what is expected when you call as one family or the moment the church is over you are running away not concerned for the welfare of our brotherhood in christ okay so fifth point we see i'm not telling anything out of that it is all there in acts 242 that's the reason the theme i have put acts acts 242 itself prayer as church now brother said if you have any prayer request this is the whatsapp number you can put your request or there is a book outside you can write why is he telling that because it is biblical he is telling that church promotes prayer church teaches prayer church practices prayer we need prayer support for one another it is we putting our request on to god with thanksgiving on to the lord as paul says in philippians 4 6 to 7 do not be anxious but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving put your request to be made known to god so 
when we gather together as church it is for prayer so we need your prayer request the church need your prayer request we need to know what struggles what challenges are you are you going through are you having any challenges as husband and wife are you having any challenges with your children are you having any challenges in the office are you having any challenges in your neighborhood are you having challenges within yourself adam manifesting more you are battling in some sin you need some help okay sixth point believers manifestations as part of church family ephesians 4:1 i urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received be completely humble gentle patient bearing with one another in love impatience many of you may have also so but when we call ourselves as believers when we come together as one body we are supposed to manifest humility jesus washed the feet of the disabled disciples who are you and me that we boast and we have arrogance in us christian life is humility christian life is gentleness when we talk to hindus when we are preaching gospel you cannot be arrogant we need to be patience eh, while we are dealing with one another because we still have adam's nature in us we have weaknesses we struggle so when i'm dealing when each of us are dealing with one another we are supposed to deal in humility not in arrogance we are supposed to deal in gentleness we are supposed to deal in patience patience 432 be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in christ god forgave you do you think you are a perfect person that you are telling the other person is not listening to you when you yourself are have been forgiven by god you need to remember that and you need to forgive others if people who are sitting here if you have not forgiven anyone if the spirit in your heart is convicting you that you need to forgive some person brother or sister maybe your friends maybe your neighbors maybe in your office then please testify to them we heard as part of the sermon today i want to confess that i had bitterness and i have not forgiven you till now but today i am forgiving you i am telling you god's name will be glorified when you do this accountability i'm coming to closing accountability hebrew 13 17 as part of the local church we are supposed to have accountability with one another suppose if there is a mirror which can display your what is going in your heart if it is shown here the entire church would have known but people who are sitting besides you may not know don't you know yourself nor don't you think god knows what is there in your heart if you have any prayer struggles if you have any battle in terms of any sin sin because i see lot of youth here i am emphasizing a little bit hold your accountability partner whom you can trust not to the person who will go and tell to other person but to the person whom you will trust make the person accountable and ask for the continuous prayer support encourage one another 29 times love one another 59 times how accountable partner as part of the local church hebrew 13 17 obey your leaders and submit to them for they are for they are keeping watching over your souls as those who will have to give an account pastor's job is very difficult they are supposed to give an account of every flock of god as part of the local church to the god on the day of judgment it is the responsibility of the pastor to make sure you are growing spiritually so at the same time you see ephesians 5:21 submitting to one another out of reverence for christ what is the meaning of submitting i submit to this brother 
I'm holding myself accountable to that brother that I'm facing this challenge. Please hold me accountable. Please question me, condemn me if I commit this sin again. At the same time, pray for me. But do it, do it in gentleness, do it in patience, do it prayerfully. But hold one another accountable as part of the church. Galatians 6.1 If anyone is caught up in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Galatians. Paul has written in the context of Galatians church. If you see anyone caught up in sin, what we are taught, I myself am not a person. Why do I need to correct the person? I myself am a sinner. I will sin, let him sin. I will not go and correct him. Let him not correct me. Who are you to tell me? This is Adam's nature. But what Paul is telling? Restore the person caught up in sin. It is your responsibility. Don't think God will come again and die again to restore that person. God has put his spirit in you and he is expecting you to do that. In 1 Corinthians 5.12 it says, it is within the church you are supposed to correct one another. It is outside the church, I judge. Means in the context of local church, if I see some person caught up in sin, it is my responsibility to restore the person by talking to him, by praying about him, by loving him. I need to restore that person gently. Don't, it is a selfish attitude to think, I will not do it, who am I to do it? That's wrong. People quote wrong scripture, Matthew 7, 1, do not judge. If you read the chapter carefully and apply the principles of biblical theology, you would understand. You, John 7, 24 says, you need to correct according to the righteous standards of Lord Jesus Christ. You need to understand Bible in the context, not one verse, one sentence, and interpret the way you want. Matthew 18, 15. Many, many people will be shocked reading this. Many people will pray that when two or three come together, your midst is there. I want to give it as an example. There is the context of the church where author Matthew has written. It is the context of a brother caught up in sin. How we need to deal with that? So if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. First, if you find a person caught up in sin as part of the church family, let one person go and tell him. Okay? If he listens, you have gained him. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Christianity is all about two or three witnesses. Okay? So when one person is telling, if he is not listening, let two or three more go and tell him to regain the brother. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Not keep it silent. Tell it to the church. Church is the body of Lord Jesus Christ. God will not compromise his holiness. When you are coming as one body, one faith, one Lord, one spirit, you cannot keep silent after knowing that some brother is caught up in sin. It's a holy gathering. When the church gathers as a family, it's a holy gathering. So go and tell to the church. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on the earth shall be bounded in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosened in heaven. Means, let one person tell, let two and three more tell, let church tell. Even if church, when he tells, if he's not listening, he's a Gentile. He, he's a Gentile, he's a tax, tax collector. You put him aside, outside the church. And whatever decision as a church you take it, my approval is there from the heaven. But what pre pray? Wherever you two gather, your midst is there. What do you mean when you are praying alone, God's presence is not there? God is the second person in the form of spirit which is within you. The triune God lives in you. When you are praying alone, does it not mean that God is the second person? Our prayers should be biblical prayers. Our prayers cannot be very casual, whatever comes to our mouth. First Timothy 5, 18 to 20. Let the elders who rule 
will be considered worthy of the double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on an evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest of all may take it as fear. You'll be shocked. What is our understanding? When false preaching is happening outside, as a local church, it is our responsibility to expose them. In YouTube, in media, God's holiness cannot be compromised. Now the scripture is telling very clearly, Timothy, that elders, uh, elders, shepherds, overseers are the synonym words for pastor. Okay? So, Timothy is telling is, double honor the pastor because he puts an effort in teaching and preaching. You double honor to him. But, 19th verse, if you have two or three witnesses of a pastor committing sin, then rebuke him in public so that the rest may stand in fear. Go and tell in private, brother, if I go and now today I'm standing here doing a false preaching, 20 people received my false preaching, and brother is coming and correcting me in private, what about the 20 people you received my false preaching? You will, 20 will go and tell 20. What will happen? 40, 40 will tell 40. That is the reason, in the context of universal church, if you see any false preaching, it is your responsibility that God's spirit is within you. It is not me who is telling, even in the context of pastor itself, the scripture is telling, rebuke in the presence of all so that everyone will know that whatever he preached is wrong. Okay, but people say, what will Hindus think? Why are we worried about Hindus? We are worried about universal church unity. We are worried about Christ. We are worried about holiness. We are worried about God's glory, not about what the other things. So as believers, we are supposed to do good deeds. Our church often tend to do this. Okay, so uh, let's go Titus 2.14 in that case. Uh, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify her in, for himself, a people for his own position, who are zealous for good works. So as believers, we are supposed to be passionate to do. It is not jealous. It is zealous. Means being passionate. Okay? So as believers, we are supposed to be passionate to do good works. Next. Titus 3.14 And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be and not be unfruitful. So we need to have devote themselves to good works. How we should be not only devotion, de, de, being devoted and diligent to reading the word of God, but we also need to be devoted to do good works. Okay. So as church family, we also are supposed to be having zealous to do good works. Heavenly angelic spear and the demonic spear will witness the entire glory of God when it is shown through the church. Let us read Ephesians 3, 9 to 10. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Means the glory of God, the wisdom of God should be known to the heavenly realms through the church. If the church is passive, not understanding the purpose of God for creating this church, how will this entire heavenly realms, the entire cosmic universe, beyond the universe, the spiritual, the spiritual realm, how will these witness what is God's glory 
when paul is writing it is through the church it is seen when the churches are passive when the people of the church are very passive when the people do not have a correct understanding of what church is how will god's glory how will god's wisdom be shown by all these spiritual realms ephesians 120 he he exerted when he raised christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms so understanding the scripture in the context it is speaking about jesus sitting besides god besides god so this is speaking about a heaven a place which is totally outside this universe which is the place where the god resides the triune god resides so if we consider heaven or angelic sphere spiritual sphere there is another sphere where all the demonic forces will be there that sphere i'm calling it as demonic sphere they will also see the glory of god the wisdom of god through the church let us see the scripture ephesians 6 12 for our struggles is not against the flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the power of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms means paul in 612 is speaking about not the heavenly realms from the context of where god is residing but paul is telling in 612 against the spiritual forces of evil means all this 33 percent of the demons which are kicked from the heaven by god they reside in one place demonic sphere they will also see when the church manifests when god manifests through the church god's glory and god's wisdom they will be surprised not only heaven but even the demonic sphere also will get surprised such a great role we have but what is our responsibility how are we living as while we are living as part of our church so church family is very very essential we have seen devoting to the word of god first we have seen love for one another we have seen encourage for one another third one fourth one lord supper fifth one prayer sixth one believers manifestation so seventh one accountability eighth one sanctification sanctification happens only in the church okay so when we gather together when we are corrected by one another only then we grow in holiness okay and then good deeds so we have seen the nine traits which we are supposed to manifest when we call ourselves as church family